Strange things wander the earth, but also there are places on this land where strange things appear to linger. For Jennifer and her children, these odd, dark entities and feelings seem to pop up both at home and on vacation. How would you react if your children knew things that couldn't be explained? Or if you yourself could feel the shadows of past evils lurking in the corners? Would you explore further? Or would you just turn over and go to sleep? Let's hear some stories today on Homespun Haints. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Haints. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. Last time we checked. And today on the show, we are going to have a repeat guest. You have heard from her before. She was in our very first season, and she's also appeared on our Patreon, and she's a patron herself. It is Jennifer, my close friend and neighbor who just keeps getting haunted. I mean, well, maybe I shouldn't cheer for Jennifer getting haunted, but... I I think she loves it as much as you or I would. (laughs) (laughs) She doesn't seem too perturbed yet, so we'll keep exploiting that while we can. (laughs) She has some some stories she's going to share with us today. Before we bring her on, though, so I know Jennifer because she's one of my mom friends, and this is the thing about being a mom. You meet other people, other moms, other dads other non-binary parents who have children about the same age as yourself. And this is how I met her, was, of course, through our children. She has a similar parenting style to me, I guess, but Mm -hmm. she's probably going to be really upset that I'm saying that after I tell this story. So (gasps) Uh (laughs) it was just one of those moments where you're like, oh, I'm that mom. (laughs) So... One of the neighbors asked me if I could bring her child to the pool with my kids. No big deal. I'm a responsible parent. I can just sit under the umbrella and read a book and hope they don't drown. So I pick up this other kid who's extremely well-behaved, great kid, bring him to the pool, and my kids look at me and say, Mom, where's the sunscreen? I'm like, oh, snap. I didn't bring sunscreen. I mean, they brought their... The only reason they have anything is because they brought their own towels. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, all right, we'll just go swim, just stay in the shade, whatever. It's only Georgia in July. So <laughs> about an hour later, they come back to me and they're like, Mom, we're hungry. What'd you bring for a snack? And I was like, uh, snap. I didn't bring a snack. Go, uh, I don't know, <laughs> just suffer. And then they were like, well, what about water bottles? Because kids these days, they always need their water bottles. <laughs> Jeez, the pool is full of water, guys. Come on. That's why, so it's like there's a sink in the bathroom. Go stick your head under it. I literally told them to do that. And they're in there like trying to figure this out because they've never done it before, like putting their head under the spigot to drink the water from the tap. They're not allergic to water like you are, (laughs) Diane. So they can do it. And then I'm like, well, I probably should feed these kids at this point. It's around dinner time. So I call my husband and I said, can you go get some food? We put in an order and he went and got some food. He shows up with food and the kids are like, okay, but do you have any like plates or forks or... (laughs) Anything to drink. (laughs) These are some demanding children. Sheesh. No, there's there's the spigot in the bathroom. (laughs) And just use your hands. Go get some paper towels out of the bathroom. You can put your food on it. Because it's like, I mean, it it, it was like nachos and tacos and stuff. Messy stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Eating nachos off of a paper towel from a public restroom is my idea of a good time. (laughs) And this whole time this is happening, I keep saying over and over again, I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. I swear I'm a good mom. (laughs) And there's a table of some dads next to me that I know. And I'm like knowing that they are hearing and seeing all of this. (laughs) And I'm a little embarrassed. But I'm like, okay, I'm just going to I'm just going to forget they're there. I'm just going to pretend that this is all perfectly normal because I do live in one of those neighborhoods where everybody's like they've got their match luggage, pool totes with the special compartments for the different food, the stuff you have to keep cold and the stuff you have to keep hot and the stuff that's crumbly and the wet wipes and the different flavored powders you can put into the kids water bottles to make the drinks taste good. And I'm there with nothing. Go to the bathroom and get a paper towel. You're like, why do you need wet wipes? Didn't you get clean in the pool? (laughs) That's my attitude. It's so wet. Yeah. So (laughs) this is going on and on. And again, I'm like, I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. They wrap up and I'm like, all right, good. We survived. 
The kids are not covered in salsa. They cleaned off in the pool. <laughs> I will deliver this child back to her mother, fed, not covered in food, and somewhat hydrated. I did my job. I'm a good mom. <laughs> and as we're packing up and getting ready to go, well, I shouldn't say, I had nothing to pack up. It was like put my phone back in the purse and stuff everything we <laughs> ate into the trash can because I do not have the match luggage of pool supplies. And my son comes up to me after this fabulous day of parenting in front of this table full of people I knew next to me and goes, Mom, what's cocaine? And at that point, I just <laughs> lost it because I was like, I think this just is the icing on the cake for the day. And I found myself because, you know, I'm the one that's always wanting to educate about everything. And I'm like, well, it's a white powdery drug that you snort through your nose and it can cause holes to go through your sinus cavities. It gives you an like awake feeling. Sometimes people call it blow. Sometimes people call it doing bumps. Sometimes, And then I stopped myself and I was like, why am I telling them all of this? Do you need to know this kid? Do you need to know this? And I was like, it was popular in the 80s. And you shouldn't do it. It'll put holes in your brain. He's like, okay. And then I'm like, where did you hear about this? And he's like, oh, so-and-so. He names off another kid. And I'm like, okay, good. Good. (laughs) (laughs) I am not the worst mom. Oh. (laughs) And then I look over at the table of dads next to me thinking, oh, God, what are they thinking of me? Because, you know, this is the South and everybody talks. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. sure, the word is going to get around the neighborhood of this whole thing. And I look over. And they can barely hold their heads up. They're so drunk. And I'm like, all right. All right. I win. I win the Parent of the Year Award on this one. So I went home having kind of mixed feelings about my parenting abilities. But <laughs> Well done being the only sober mom at the pool who didn't have wet wipes. That's a, that's a high honor in your neighborhood, I'm sure. You're a great mom. Huh? You heard all of that? Yeah, Aw, you are a great mom. Aw. Thanks, sweetheart. Okay, thanks. That was very sweet. That was very sweet. Oh, even teenagers who hate everybody love you. Well, I <laughs> I do feed them tacos. So. That's true. <laughs> even if they have to stick their face under the sink to wash instead of using a napkin. <laughs> to be fair, a lot of times the reasons people have all of that stuff, they lug with them to the pool is so they have a cooler for their beer. Damn right. A Damn. mirror for their blow. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> what the matching diaper bags are all about, really. I have never seen anybody do blow at my pool. (laughs) It's kind of windy in Georgia. I wouldn't. You're not going to do it out in the open. There are bathroom stalls in there. Mm. Did you mention to your son most people will not do it out in the open. They'll do it in a bathroom stall. I did not say that to him. (laughs) (laughs) Nor list everybody in my family that does it. That's a good one. You've got a lot of family lifestyle examples. Like when your kids ask about (laughs) drugs, you could just be like, you remember uncle so-and-so? Yeah, don't do drugs, kids. I'm sure you've got enough examples. that. Oh, I do. I'm like, you remember that guy? Yeah. Don't do drugs, kids. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You got to have a legacy of some sort. (laughs) Yeah, don't do drugs, especially if you're a kid. Yeah, especially if you're a kid. (laughs) That's our PSA for the day. Good mom PSA. And if you are a new mom and you are feeling the burden of all of the standards you have to live up to, to make sure you have everything perfect with you, with your Lillian Vernon diaper bag and your coach diaper pad and I don't know what else, (laughs) you can just show up and if the kids shit themselves, get some leaves. (laughs) (laughs) You can do this on the fly. (laughs) <laughs> Take the pressure off yourself. <laughs> you remember what the doctor said while I was waiting for surgery to the pregnant patient? Okay, tell the story. Waiting for a surgery at the uh, gastroenterologist. I'm wearing a gown. I'm behind a flimsy little clear curtain for privacy and about to get shot up with general anesthesia when I hear one of the doctors remark to one of the patients who's pregnant, don't worry, women have been giving birth for at least 4,000 years. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, oh, no, take this IV out. I want to go home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't my doctor. My oh, thank doctor. God. Yeah, I was going to say, why is the OB and the gastroenterologist the same doctor? Not, fortunately, not. <laughs> that would be funny. Just, just mansplaining how pregnancy and human evolution have not ever <laughs> happened before 4,000 right. years ago. Can you imagine if the same person It's be like getting in, getting uh, all scrubbed up and be like, which hole am I going in today? Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> we could do a bundled procedure. <laughs> oh. 
colonoscopy and C-section. <laughs> so moving on, <laughs> how did we go from pull time and coke to C-sections and butt plugs? Because you're know. a good mom. I'm a good mom. Did I just say butt plugs? All right. That has nothing to do with any of this. Let's move on. So. <laughs> Speaking of patrons. <laughs> would that be a great homespun Haints gift? Like, Ooh, haunted butt plug. <laughs> I was thinking one that had our logo on it. but oh, Like oh, glass. It's like engraved. and gla- Ooh, glass. maybe not. I don't know. Hmm. That Maybe not a good idea. Sorry. That's not what our patrons get. But our patrons <laughs> do get. You never know. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, right now they're getting soap. (laughs) We want to give you guys a shout out because we are on a mission to get 100 patrons by September 1st. So I can come into, come into, oh, Jesus, what is wrong with me? I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. I'm a good mom. I I almost said come into Diana. So, so I can come to Diana's house. Poor Jennifer. She's going to listen to this and be like, oh my God, you. So I want to come to Diana's house. If we get 100 patrons by September 1st, I'm going to come to Diana's house. Penetrate my secret passage. We are going to open up the secret passage in Diana's basement where we believe something might be stuck. There's a ghost in her basement. We think it has something to do with something that might be in that secret passage. But Diana is afraid to open it up herself because she knows she'll get some really weird disease if she does so. And I already already have all the weird diseases, so I don't mind. Being from Florida and all. Yeah. So anyway, I will come to Diana's house. We will open up that secret passage. We will live stream it, but only if we get 100 patrons by September 1st. We do have some people who are very excited to help us get there. We had Cindy up her pledge to... (gasps) Thank you, Cindy. Yeah, very high tier. Thank you so much, Cindy. I sent her a thank you message and she's like, I want to see what's in the passage. (laughs) (laughs) Don't we all? (laughs) So thank you so much, Cindy, for upping your tier. Also, thank you to Beth and Tony for becoming patrons of the show. So we are getting a little bit closer every day. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Tony. And also thank you to our guest, Jennifer, for your continued support. I am sorry that this is the preamble before (laughs) your (laughs) stories. But doesn't it make you feel like a good mom? (laughs) When you explain butt plugs and blow to your kids. (laughs) But (laughs) if you're not a patron, enjoy this commercial. today we have a repeat guest we have jennifer she appeared on our second ever episode way back in 2019 (laughs) when we were all a lot younger and pre-covid anyway so we are back with jennifer because jennifer keeps getting haunted you may have seen her she's appeared on our live seances she has patreon episodes she's actually one of our Patreon members. So thank you so much for that, Jennifer. I have a bar of soap for you, by the way. Oh, yeah, you know I need that. You know I'll use that anyway, I should say. (laughs) It's it's not implying anything. It's it's just, it's soap made in a haunted house. Perfect. All our patrons got a haunted soap from a haunted house made by Becky's family, her flesh and blood. It's not actually made of flesh and blood. As long as the soap isn't haunted? I don't think so. You never know. Anyway, Jennifer, I know you wanted to talk to us about an experience you had. You and I and Katie of Lady Teal's Curios and Christy, who writes for us sometimes, we all took a trip to Savannah last year in March, and we managed to get ourselves haunted because that's exactly why we went. That's what we were going for. (laughs) And you had a much more intense experience, I think, than the rest of us. So do you want to just tell us where we went and talk a little bit about what you encountered? Yes, yes, I would love to. I thought of this story for a few reasons. One being that it's actually someplace that other people can go and they can experience this for themselves or experience all the different stories that have come out of this location. And also just thinking about our trip there and our journey to this Sorrel Weed House made me have other questions, other questions, and then hopefully tie this in with some of the other ghostly questions that this experience has brought to me. 
Ooh. The trip was really cool. The trip was put together by Lady Teal, which was great. She did an awesome job putting us a very spooky trip together. We stayed at a haunted B&B. We went yes. to haunted restaurants, got to see oddities, <laughs> shops, and really enjoy Savannah in the way that spooky Savannah should be visited. We did the Sorrel Wheat House. Now, I didn't know anything about the house going in. This old Savannah, once prominent family lived there. So they had all the really cool stuff inside. And they were really able to showcase some of that old wealth. You go into the house, you're in the main floor of the home. With a tour, you're listening to the tour guide. Of course, you're looking. There's just people. So there's really a lot going on. So I didn't expect to experience anything really other than the place itself and just take in the stories. And that's very much for me what the top floor was like. We were there. We got to see the cool mirror. Supposedly people have seen people behind them when they've looked in the mirror. So we all took turns in the mirror and went into the parlor where they had parties. And it's difficult for me in locations where there is that tour, people are talking and there's all the bustle to really think that I could have any kind of connection. We'd done a considerable amount of talking and uh -huh. listening and looking. And we go into the basement, still the same, right? We're going downstairs. And right away, it was just a shift in energy. It was just like a shift in, oh, yeah, wow. You can really feel it. I could really feel. And Becky was like, oh, something touched me. The cold on the back of my neck kind of, whoa. There is something, and actually more than one something, going on down there. This is where, Becky, when you told this story, this is where you said you turned around because you felt somebody so close to you, behind you, touching you, but that there was nobody else behind you. Exactly. Yeah. I thought Katie was actually behind me. I thought she was coming up the rear. And so I turned to talk to her and nobody was there. And I turned back and she was in front of me and had been the whole time. Like you said, Jennifer, I felt somebody touch me. I thought it was like, hey, look at this kind of thing. So I whipped around and I was alone. Independently, you both had your own experiences just the moment you entered that room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was right as soon as we got down the stairs. Yeah. Wow. Yes, definitely. It was just like right down the stairs and whoa. You know, I could tell there was just a change in energy and just it felt different. So whatever, Becky had this just the right off the bat. Something was like, oh, hello, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> As we went through the tour in the downstairs, I really couldn't pay attention to what the tour guide was saying. I missed a lot of the story because I was just so focused on what's over here, what's over here. I just had to sort of take my own tour and go where I felt. And there was this small room off and behind what would have been where people would have cooked. And there was just really this energy, just really intense hatred, meanness, not towards anybody, but more like it was held energy there. It felt like if you're helpless and very mad, there's just nothing you can do about your situation and you're just infuriated. That is what it felt like. It didn't feel malicious so much as just more than frustrated, just very angry at everything. That felt weird over there. So we went over to this other spot where there was a little chair. And then I do remember being like, I should listen to this tour. <laughs> I'm missing all the details. <laughs> and the tour guide was saying something about a little boy being seen there before. And that was like its area of this kid where it would run and they would see it and feel it over in this area. And there was a chair there. Now, I remember sitting down and not really getting anything from over there because I was so concerned with the other corner. I was really focused on what was going on over there. But we had our pictures made in this chair. And I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not getting anything over here. But all three of the rest of the group looked kind of terrified. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I think we still have those photos. <laughs> it really wasn't until after we left the tour did I start to see imagery from this story? And it was just from that corner was a man. It's a black man. And he was, I just, one thing I got were hands, like big, thick, heavy, sore hands. And just that frustration that not being able to control your life and being so mad about it. It was so sad. It was really heartbreaking. Other things I got was like, 
I think it was this man's story or around him. I don't know if it happened to him or was somebody around him, but someone fell and hit their head outside was like damaged. And I don't know if that was from him or somebody else, but people treated him like he wasn't smart, like he couldn't do anything right. Like he was just no good. Hmm. Yeah. Right. It was terrible. So it was a terrible to feel that and experience that. But then to also think like this person, is it really a ghost that's trapped there? Or is it just that anger that's just in that basement? And then what about also the little boy and the thing that touched you? These were three separate things I'm getting here. Did you actually see the little boy? No, but just I got imagery of a little boy hitting his head outside. Oh, so it was a little boy that you saw hitting his head. Yeah. But oddly, I think the tour guide said the woman fell off the balcony and died and hit her head. She died on that pavement. Well, we learned later that she didn't. She actually died at the house next door. So even though the tour guide said that she had killed herself and that her ghost was still haunting the area because her husband had had an affair with one of the enslaved people, had forced her into being his mistress. The real story is that the wife suffered from depression, and they made up the story about the mistress as a way to kind of cover up her own torment and mental illness that she was dealing with. Oh, that's terrible. And they had actually moved next door by the time that she died, and had gone from being the Sorrel house to the Weed house at that point. Oh. The little boy, did you pick up if he was part of the family or if he was one of the enslaved kids? Yeah, he was working when this happened. It was like doing something and working. Yeah, just for a little bit of context, this basement would have been where the servants would have been. It was downstairs. It was hot. It was dark. There are barely any windows. They would have had four or five fires going at all times to cook. The ceilings were low. And it just seems like an absolutely miserable existence, especially in a Savannah summer. And there were just hundreds of people down there working. I I can't even imagine. Very reasonable for anybody who worked down there to be full of rage. You got a distinct image of like a particular man. And I remember you telling me shortly after we left, you were like, I feel like there's a man and something about falling out of a cart and hitting a head. Like I do remember you saying that. So you were picking up on that pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, it seemed really strong. You guys talk to more people about this. I feel like you know more about it than I do. Is that like just like a memory? Is it just energy stuck there? Is it necessarily a ghost? That particular location does have the reputation of being the most haunted house in Savannah. I'm not going to deny or accept that, but that's the reputation it has. But it just so happens that the house was built on top of the site of one of the bloodiest battles in the Revolutionary War. So... There's a lot of trauma that took place on that land. And then to have built a house on top where people felt trapped and they very well could have been encountering the ghosts down there while they worked too. Ooh, yeah. But I just feel like it's kind of this perfect storm of bad energy. Yeah. I would have really liked to spend some quiet time there. (laughs) Checking it out. That would have been neat. Maybe we can go back and do that sometime. So would you say that this was more of an active haunting or did it feel more like an imprint or a residual haunting? It felt more residual. Okay. Well, that's actually positive. That means that maybe somebody wasn't trapped there. It was just the leftover energy. But it sounds like it was really strong. If you were getting that much imagery from 150 years ago, that's pretty incredible. Do you think that maybe the fact that so many people had this experience over and over again through the years, so many enslaved people would have gone through this exact same situation that it just kind of built everybody who had this experience? Built on top of one another? Yeah. Yeah, that is really interesting. I mean, it's possible, right, that there could have been just this build up of trauma and venom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're already upset and then that energy is there of all those before you, you're going to soak that up psychically. With that many people in there, I'm sure some of them were psychic, just law of averages, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. And then all that amplified. And like you're saying, it was on already on a place of a mass tragedy. So it just keeps compiling. I wonder what will happen to this place. I remember when I was walking by the house when we were leaving, I also caught, it was weird. It was just a flash, but like I heard 
voices of party goers and people talking like coming out of the windows as if the windows were open to let in the night air and there was a party going on inside. It was again, it was just for a flash and then it was gone. But it was such a stark difference from what we experienced down in that basement because that basement was heavy. It just sat on your chest kind of heavy. I don't think anybody could not have felt that. Tapping you on the back. <laughs> yeah, it was, there was something there behind me. I was like, what, who, what, what do you want? You know, <laughs> but that was also kind of cool. Cause I was like, yes, I got haunted in the snow. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> we would have been bummed if we had gone and just been like, oh, that was interesting. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> most haunted place in one of the most haunted cities in the U.S. Nothing happened. All I got oh. was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> well, you weren't actually frightened though, of anything that you experienced in the Sorrel Weed House. No. I was frightened of that 19th century wheelchair they had. That was terrifying. There was this room where they had this old wheelchair. A doctor had been in there. So you would have loved it, Diana. There were like medical instruments and things. That was kind of creepy. I used to own a wooden 19th century wheelchair, yes. Of course you did. <laughs> Do you have a mannequin? <laughs> Push it around. <laughs> I had a mannequin, but in a totally different house. So. <laughs> I was just thinking of the surgeries that would have taken place on the table there. And ugh, like, mm, there's a wheelchair there because of all the legs you cut off. Ugh. Oh, those amputations. Yeah, and I do want to clarify, overall, it was like a fun, spooky experience. It wasn't that it wasn't scary. Like the whole thing was kind of like, oh, ooh, yeah, there's supposed to be lots of ghosts here. It was a fun, spooky feeling. Oh, fun, yeah. spooky, not feeling threatened, spooky. Yes, that is yeah. what I meant when I said no. Like, I didn't feel like we got to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So were there any other things that you experienced while you were in Savannah? I did have one weird thing, and it seems random, and I don't even know if this is possible. So before we go, I had these earrings on. They were like dangle earrings and they were had crystal little crystal ships on the bottom. Okay. So they were kind of dangly, but I had them. They were in. I'm outside. I'm just standing talking outside to someone. I wasn't active. I wasn't gardening or <laughs> doing anything. Just standing there talking. And I felt one of my earrings jerk. It's like, oh, that's weird. And there it was. I felt it. Oh, there's my earring. And then like five minutes later, my neighbor was like, I really like those earrings. But she was like, did you lose one? Like, what? The earring was gone. And I just, it felt like some little pirate or something. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to Savannah. And I was wondering, is it possible to have things stolen from you? Oh. I was thinking about that the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I found a few things on the ground while I was there, just little trinkets that had just dropped here and there. I found like two different pieces of jewelry while I was In there. In Savannah? On the ground. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Actually, I was just telling somebody the other day that when I'm staying in a haunted hotel, I'm afraid to take my jewelry off at night and leave it on the nightstand because I'm afraid. That's a common thing that you'll hear about is like ghosts will take your jewelry. Oh, They'll yeah. run off with it. And like, I don't want to lose my engagement ring or something. Oh, I knew it. Yeah, and I'm really mad because it was a really cute little pair of earrings, too. Oh, it never showed up again. No. Oh, Ooh. no. And I looked and my neighbor looked and we were only in one little area. I had not been anywhere else. We were perplexed. We were like, how could that thing go missing? You just touched it. Yeah, it was there. In your ear, didn't mm -hmm. move, and then it's gone. Right in it's front of her totally eyes. She was gone. watching you the whole time. And I thought, oh, it's in my crazy hair. I've got curly hair. <laughs> like, oh, it's just caught up in there somewhere. No. <laughs> that happens. Yeah, it wasn't in my clothing, not in my bra, wasn't, you know, usual suspects. Why? Nope. And this was right before you left for Savannah? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can, you know, I just, why I connected those, you know, like, oh, it's these damn pirates. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Time moves differently for ghosts. Maybe they knew you were coming or to them you had already been there. I know you've seen other things around your house, are you at all comfortable talking about that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. That, I thought that was a really interesting experience. So interesting that I had to be like, Becky, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> this thing happened to me. Yeah. Because it was very odd. I'll set it up for you here. I was on my back porch, so open porch, with my husband and his sister. And we were hanging out just, it was 1030 at night, not too late, over to the side of the house to the left of me, it seemed like maybe there was an animal creeping over there. 
And I thought, oh, there's something over there. I wonder what it is. But I didn't want to get up and scare it. So I thought, well, I'm just going to look over that way. And if it's right there, there's a fence. So it can't go too far in my house. So it'd be between the house and the fence. There was an open area just off to the side of the porch where I was seeing this thing. Uh, well, it's coming towards the house, so it'll set off the motion light, and I'll see what it is. So I'm watching. I tell them, hey, guys, I think something's over there. Maybe it's a deer. It'll probably set off that motion light in a minute. And they're like, what? Okay, whatever. And so <laughs> we're just kind of looking that way, but they're still talking. And nothing ever happened, but I could tell something was still there. But I didn't want to tell them. I didn't want to freak them out like, whoa, y'all, something is there. <laughs> no. So I'm just talking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In the conversation, just staring in that direction. What is over there? I let my eyes adjust to it. There was a person, like a ghost. It was a spirit, spirit, I should say, it sums it up best there, but it had on like an animal fur, like a cloak, mm. like it was walking, but didn't want to be seen, but it saw me and I saw it. So you know it saw you? Did it look at you? Yeah, yeah. It was like it knew like, oh, there's something over there. And I'm like, oh, there's something over there. But it, it, I think it just it just kind of got back behind its veil or whatever this. It, it really felt like an animal cloak, skin animal, and just wow. kept going. Isn't that neat? So you say ghost, but it almost seems like it could have been something more of like an elemental or fae or something like that. Because if it's cloaking itself in animal skin, like, ooh, I'm going to pretend to be a deer or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it a, a costume, a disguise specifically? Yeah. But not like a, a rich woman in a fur coat. No. No. Not no. like a furry. Like <laughs> Right. No. It was a, it, the ancient furry. Frisky ghost. <laughs> An ancient furry. Okay. So like a, a primitive animal skin. Yes. From a hunt of some sort. Yes, it must have. Yes, something like that. Mm -hmm. Anything about your land that would give that context, do you think? This whole region used to just be woods, I guess. Who knows? I mean, it could be really anything, like maybe not connected to the land, or maybe there was someone who lived here that just walks this area. I just happened to be around when it was doing a tour. Maybe we're pushing the fey folk out of their habitats, just like we are the bear and deer. Oh, we probably are. Yeah. yeah. We're just in their backyards. They're our backyards, right? Yeah. I was like, well, I'm just going to sneak by. I'll just dress like a tiger in case anybody sees me. Yeah. <laughs> so it just kind of skulked behind the shadows once it realized you could see it. I wouldn't say skulked. I, I, I felt like it seemed still very strong. If it was wearing an animal skin, it could have been some kind of a selkie. A what? Selkie. What's a selkie? What's that? A changeling, a shapeshifter that it keeps an animal skin, and then it, when it puts on the skin, it becomes that animal. And the oh. way that you would, in lore, the way that you would capture one is to take its skin, and then it has to be your mail order bride, or basically <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> your concubine, whatever, until you give it its skin mm -hmm. back. But they're all types, and no reason why one wouldn't be hanging out in your backyard. I don't know. Yeah. Like you said, it used to be forest. I did later want to see if it was still there, maybe think about connecting with it somehow. But I really got a sense that it it really didn't want that. It didn't want to be seen. It didn't want to have that connection. It happened to see me and then it didn't like go quickly or, or, or kind of like hide away. It was just like, nope, and kept yeah. going. <laughs> so like Homer Simpson in the hedge. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yes, so much. <laughs> well, if you're ever cleaning around, raking leaves back there, and you happen to see an animal pelt, be sure to grab it. Because oh. you never know. You could have yourself a new concubine. <laughs> oh, I don't want the concubine. I think you encountered something that was like of the earth. That's my thoughts. Yeah, those words make total sense. You saying that and just that feeling, almost a smell, almost just it was really very much of the earth. You've told me of other things about your daughter and the things that she's experienced. Yeah, just recently in the past month, we went to San Francisco, took big family trip, lots of people, lots going on. And on one leg of the trip, we rented a house in Sonoma County, great big house that we could all fit in. It was way out in the country, like no cell service. I, I don't know how this works. How do you be an hour from a major city 
and there's no cell service. You're, you're out there. <laughs> That's <laughs> the West. Pretty... It's the West. Yeah. So we're in this house in Sonoma County. We get there and we get in. All of course, everybody's, which room is mine? And they're looking in the different rooms. The girls, they're an eight-year-old girl and a seven-year-old girl. And they were going to stay, the girls were going to stay together. So it was two girls and then 11-year-old. The 11-year-old decided to stay with the younger kids because the room I had picked out for her, she went in. And it was just this small room, brightly colored. Everything was yellow and there was flowers, but it was off. It felt weird. So she went in there and she sat and she got on her iPad and she was like, Mm-mm, I'm not staying in here. <laughs> got up and went up to where the two young girls were staying, which was in a loft. And you had to not climb steps, but a ladder to climb a ladder to get up into this sort of finished attic area that they'd made into a loft. Now, it didn't have a big overlook like some lofts would. It was really sort of back in the corner. I finally climbed up into the loft because I had to help them get situated. They were up there arguing about who was going to sleep in what bed because no one wanted to sleep in the dark corner. (laughs) I was like, okay, I've got to go up there. (laughs) So I'm climb the ladder and get up there. And there were three little beds, little single beds, real small. And really, honestly, it looked like whoever set up this room was setting it up to be in a horror movie. I mean, it couldn't have looked creepier. It didn't have like cobwebs or dirt. It didn't look grimy. It just looked creepy. There was just three little beds. In one corner, there was no bed. There was this little rocking chair and a rug in front of it, a little wooden toy train set out. Like, oh, gosh. No lamps. You know? Were there any dolls? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh God. <laughs> of and there so were dolls. I went up there. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So the dark corner that they wouldn't go in, I had to actually move the whole bed, move the bed frame, move the bed out of the dark corner so that they could all stay up there. So when you say the dark corner, was it just dark light-wise or did it just feel dark? It just felt dark. No, they had, so there was wooden beams across, uh, above them in a sort of A-frame. And on the wooden beams that went horizontally across were fairy lights. So the whole upstairs, the whole area would have been lit equally. They went up and down the beams the same. Yeah, it felt dark. And they were the ones that said it. They were like, "Mm -mm, that's a dark corner. Nope. (laughs) So this childhood fantasy. But I go up there and I'm like, yeah, it really feels strange. It was just kid stuff. Why would it look so creepy as soon as you walk up there? So I moved the bed and nobody went to the corner. Even when the boy cousins came up, they just, no one went over there. It was just off limits. (laughs) It's weird how they know sometimes. Yeah. But we were really all too busy. At night, I was hearing noises and felt things. And honestly, we were just too busy. I couldn't deal. I was like, sorry, I'm going I'm going to sleep. <laughs> Classic Becky move, too. Yeah. <laughs> too haunted, going back to sleep. <laughs> How do you do that? I guess I did it. So I know. I, know yeah. I just can't deal with this right now. I'm tired. It'll go away in the morning. <laughs> I was thinking about the time that you took your daughter to the cemetery in Roswell, the, the Founders. Founder Cemetery. Yeah. We were waiting for an appointment. I was just like, oh, let's just walk up here and go walk around. It's a cemetery. And she's like, okay. When she kind of runs up the steps, it's not like she was scared of it or thinking that anything bad was going on. So she's just walking around. But then she just gets this feeling It's not a very big cemetery. Just go over into this one little section. And she's just like, no, I want to leave. I want to leave right now. And then she just starts walking away. She was like, come on, we're getting out of here. (laughs) I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll go. I won't torture you. (laughs) She said that it seemed like there was a wall. There used to be a wall where we were standing. She said something about a separation of people. She was like, oh, no, there was other people back here. Back There was a wall, and there were, like, other people back there. I didn't want to go past that wall. Oh, Becky, knowing everything you do about that cemetery, what do you think? Well, there's hundreds of unmarked graves in there. One section has a few graves, and then another section looks like a field. And in the 80s, they did sonar and discovered all of the bodies there, and they put little stones there to kind of mark them. But my guess is that they were either fallen soldiers or enslaved people that they just kind of like, oh, we can bury them here. But there is definitely a weirdness to the place. It's like the headstones 
are very ornate, very rich, but they're just clustered in this one little area. And the rest of the area before they put the rocks up would have been just completely empty or looked empty. Like, mm, or had walls separating the big, nice cemetery from the others. Mm-hmm. Yes. From those that didn't have the, as much money or were enslaved. That's interesting that she immediately thought that there had been a wall there. Seems so random, which, right? Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh. Even if it wasn't a physical <laughs> wall, maybe just psychologically there was a difference to that area. It could be. Yeah, there's no trace of anything there, but I think there definitely is like a, a separation. Maybe it was just a feeling of separation. It's pretty palpable when you're there. Well, Jennifer, I'm certain your kids are growing up with the same sensitivity you have. I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, that's okay. I I hope they're not scared of it. You know, I grew up thinking that everything was scary. And the first time I encountered a really visual ghost, it just scared the hell out of me. I think it opened my eyes to, yeah, there's, there's definitely things out there. And yeah, I can sometimes feel things. But I really didn't spend any time getting to know that because it just seemed like it was something that happened to me rather than me sort of seeking it out or or knowing more about it. Like, oh, maybe something will happen again someday. And then I think at some point I really kind of of closed it off because I I just didn't have time. I didn't have the capacity. And also still having that feel of fear. Didn't want to invite things that it shouldn't be into my life, into my home and, and around me contrast that with now that I'm like, ah, let's do it. And really sort of going head first without any protection. (laughs) But I I think I'm fine. I think that I have a a sort of confidence about me that I know I've heard enough people just say like, go away, get away. I haven't put myself hopefully in too many situations where it would have been super dangerous. I appreciate you sharing all of those stories with us. It's such a plethora of interesting encounters that you have. And I'm sure there will be more as I hope so. <laughs> as yeah, we I, continue I'm, to look for haunted places together. I'm definitely into it and ready. Pretty sure cool. we're going to find some fun stuff. Absolutely. It sounds yeah. like your legacy is going to be to teach your children to not be scared, but to take precautions. Yes. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. You. I appreciate you coming on. It's always such a good time to talk to you. You have really unique interactions with these things and a lot of very perceptive insight into what these things are. So really, really appreciate you sharing all of that with us. Well, thanks. It's always nice to talk to you guys. Thanks for having me. Painted Loves, if you find yourself in an Airbnb with a dark corner, or you find your future mail-order bride skulking through your backyard, you're going to have a spooky day. Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit. <laughs>